very good evening and a warm welcome to Primetime News on TV1. I'm Zina Tosafa, joined by a news interpreter for tonight, Brian De Cruz, via Zoom. Let's first take a look at your headlines for today. April 21st attacks, commission report presented to Asgiri, Malwatu Mahanayakas and the Cardinal. Chief Justice urged to inquire into contempt of court through recommendations of the Political Victimization Commission. Secretariat established four trilateral national security advisors between India, the Maldives and Sri Lanka. China commences bunkering process at Hambantota port. Indian Prime Minister receives Indian COVID-19 vaccine. Your top story tonight, four attorneys filed a complaint with the Chief Justice today requesting for an investigation to determine if the final recommendation of the report of the Presidential Commission of Inquiry probing incidents of political victimization caused contempt of court. The complaint filed by four attorneys at law seeks an inquiry to determine whether the recommendations of the Presidential Commission appointed to probe alleged political victimization between the 8th of January 2015 and the 19th of November 2019 have caused a breach of justice and contempt of court, as well as damage to the judiciary and civil liberties. The complaint was filed with the Registrar of the Supreme Court by Counsel Seneca Pereira, Achala Seneviratna, Namal Rajapaksa and Thambaya Jeratna Raja. The lawyers who filed the complaint point out that the extraordinary Gazette notification number 2157 forward slash 44, which appointed the Presidential Commission on Political Victimization, has not made any enforcement with respect to courts or cases in courts. Councils in the complaint noted the Presidential Commission recommending for the Supreme Court decision on the appeal filed by Duminda Silva, who was sentenced to death to be reviewed, and also citing that Duminda Silva is a victim of political persecution, had caused contempt to the justice and fairness served by the court. The report of the Presidential Commission of Inquiry appointed to probe the 2019 April 21st attacks was presented to the Mahanaikas of the Askiri and Malbatha chapters today. The report of the Presidential Commission of Inquiry appointed to probe the April 21st attack was presented to the Mahanayak of the Malwatu chapter, the Most Venerable Tibbatwe Shri Sumangalatero, and the Mahanayak of the Askari chapter, the Most Venerable Varakagoda Shri Nyanaratanatero. The President's Media Division said the report was handed over by the Director General of Legal Affairs at the Presidential Secretariat, Hari Gupta Rohanadira, at the Malwatu Mahavihare and the Askari Mahavihare. In addition, the report of the Presidential Commission of Inquiry appointed to probe the April 21st attack has been presented to His Eminence Malcolm Cardinal Ranjit. <laughs> The Commission does not have a mandate to impose punishments. That is a wrong position. The Commission is not a court. The Commission does not operate as per the evidence ordinance and it does not apply there as well. Therefore, the Commission does not have the power to single out a person and say that this person needs to be punished. <laughs> The Commission does not impose the punishment. The Attorney General must file charges in court. Don't misunderstand what I said. I did not say that the perpetrators cannot be punished. They must be punished, but they will be punished, not by the Commission, but by the judiciary of this country. We completely reject that. Who appointed this presidential commission? Was it us? This is a commission appointed by the government of good governance. I accept that this report is not complete in every way. But that does not mean that the report has no value. 
this report is very valuable in many aspects. We need to take the positive parts of this and the government must implement them. The victims of the 2019 April attacks will not receive any form of relief from the report of the Presidential Commission of Inquiry. So we have to ask this government as to who gained political benefit from the attack and who didn't. Why are they reluctant to reveal the truth behind the April 21st attack? Who is hiding information? What is this invisible force? A top intelligence official says before the commission that there was another person or a group in addition to Zaharan and his terrorist group. Who are they? The whole country is waiting for the truth to be revealed. Please do not hide the truth from the people. We have nothing to hide in this regard now. The commission to probe the April 21st tax was appointed by the previous government. Then the parliamentary subcommittee was appointed and the Malit Jatilka report was submitted by the previous government. We see that the previous government sacrificed some officials to protect politicians. We have time until the 15th of March to act on this, and action will be taken to submit a report on it. Although they are looking at who failed in preventing the attack, they have not tried to find out who was behind it. There is a serious debate in our country about this matter. The United States has filed a case against two suspects. An international lawsuit has been filed in this regard. A secretariat for trilateral national security advisors on maritime security cooperation between India, the Maldives and Sri Lanka was inaugurated in Colombo. The Media Center for the Ministry of Defense said in keeping with the discussions held at the previous National Security Advisor level trilateral meetings on maritime security cooperation with India and the Maldives, a Secretariat for Trilateral National Security Advisors on Maritime Security Cooperation was established at the Sri Lanka Navy headquarters in Colombo. Secretary, Ministry of Defense and State Ministry of National Security and Disaster Management, retired General Kamal Gunaratna, Foreign Ministry Secretary Admiral Professor Janath Kolomagay retired, Navy Commander Vice Admiral Nishant Ulgetanna and the Defence Attaches of India and Maldives were present at the brief opening ceremony. The entire world is benefited with this initiative as the Indian Ocean is the lifeline of the entire world, said the Foreign Secretary Admiral Professor Kolomagay. According to the Navy Commander Vice Admiral Nishant Ulgetanna, the fully-fledged new Secretariat will be operated 24-7. India and the Maldives are closely working with the United States of America. Therefore, agreements such as this can be viewed as part of the U.S. Indo-Pacific plan to exert influence on the Indian Ocean. Last week, Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan commented on the One Belt, One Road initiative by China and the Sri Lankan government had agreed to it. The government is allowing one certain camp to use Sri Lanka for its strategic purposes. At the same time, the government is also allowing the opposing camp under the same principle. Eventually, security in the Indian Ocean will be threatened and Sri Lankans will lose their security as well. When the incumbent president contested the polls, one of his main campaign slogans was to secure national security. How can one secure national security when Sri Lanka is in the midst of a global power struggle? In 1978, Sri Lanka signed the Non-Aligned Movement, agreeing that the Indian Ocean is a peaceful zone and will not be involved in any conflict. However, present-day agreements violate 1978 Non-Aligned Movement Agreement. Further, it also poses a threat to the lives of the people of Sri Lanka. We condemn these moves and the government's efforts to secretly sign agreements that threaten the security of the people. A memorandum of understanding was signed in New Delhi today to commence a ferry service from Kankasanture to Karekal in Pondicherry, India. The MOU was signed by Managing Director of the Sagarmala Project, Dilip Kumar Gupta, and C. Niranjan Nandagopan from the Indian Ferry Service. Twenty-three Indian Air Force planes have arrived in Sri Lanka to take part in an aerobatic display at Golface to mark the 70th anniversary of the Sri Lanka Air Force. Sri Lanka Air Force spokesperson group captain Dushan Vijay Singh speaking to News First said the Indian Air Force planes are in Sri Lanka following an invitation extended by the Sri Lankan Air Force. 
The Indian planes include nine Surya Kiran or Hawks aerobatic team aircraft. In addition, the Sarang Advanced Light Helicopter Team and nine other aircraft arrived at the Sri Lanka Air Force Base in Katunaika. To commemorate the 70th anniversary of the Sri Lanka Air Force, a fly past and an aerobatic display will take place at Golf Face from the 3rd to the 5th of March from 5 p.m. onwards. As you know, the Sri Lanka Air Force will celebrate its 70th anniversary tomorrow. Now, in line with this celebration, an aerobatic display and a, and a fly past will be happening from the 3rd to the 5th of March here in Gaul Face. Now, as a gesture of solidarity, uh, the Indian Air Force and its naval forces too will take part in this event. As you can see behind me, uh, the preparations for this event is already being underway. Uh, the Sri Lanka Air Force is eagerly organizing this event. So from the 3rd to the 5th of March, uh, you will be able to witness the military might of two countries here in Gaul Face. Now, when the News First team arrived here, we saw uh, training exercises done by the aircrafts of Sri Lanka Air Force, belonging to the Sri Lanka Air Force and the Indian Air Force. And uh, it will be quite something to see from the 3rd to the 5th of March. I'm Sanitha Sinanayaka reporting for News The Ceylon Petroleum Corporation is taking steps to construct an oil storage facility in the vicinity of the Trincomalee Harbour under a joint venture with India. Ceylon Petroleum Corporation Chairman Sumit Vijay Singh told News First that the Sri Lanka Port Authority has agreed to hand over 100 acres of land under its purview for the construction of this facility. He noted that a memorandum of understanding will be signed with the Sri Lanka Port Authority for the construction of the storage facility that will be called the South Asian Petroleum Hub. We hope that this project would turn out to be a massive one that is not confined to 200 or 300 acres of land. We are starting the project on a 100 acre plot of land. We are holding talks with the Indian Oil Corporation and other entities to transform this into a project that would benefit the country. We are involved in the process of importing fuel based on the requirement of the country. We have requested 100 acres of land belonging to the Mahaveli Authority near the Hammantota port. We have identified the land and they have agreed to give it to us. As the Ceylon Petroleum Corporation plans to embark on a project to meet local fuel demand, the Hambantota International Port Group, under which the port has been given to China on a 99-year lease period, has begun fuel bunkering services. The Hambantota International Port Group has begun the project in partnership with the local company of Chinese giant Sinopec, identified as Sinopec Fuel Oil Lanka Limited and a local partner as well. A floating oil platform serves as a key component in the oil bunkering project that saw a large amount of fuel first being purchased by a commercial vessel plying from Chennai to Suze. The Belt and Road Initiative in Sri Lanka tweeted that the objective of the project is to transform the Hambantota port into a South Asian petroleum hub that offers high quality and secure services. Various views are being expressed on matters concerning Sri Lanka that are being discussed at the 46th United Nations Human Rights Council sessions that are currently underway in Geneva. During an interactive dialogue at the UNHRC sessions on the 25th of February, China voiced strong objections to the report of the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights in Sri Lanka, citing that it interferes with the internal affairs of the country. The Belt and Road Initiative in Sri Lanka tweeted that Russia, Pakistan, Iran, Vietnam, Maldives, Cuba, Nicaragua, Eritrea, Nepal, Colombia, Laos, Belarus, Guinea, North Korea, Syria and Azerbaijan, together with China, support Sri Lanka at the United Nations Human Rights Council sessions. What is India's official stance on Sri Lanka? at the UN Human Rights Council sessions. Speaking at the ongoing UN Human Rights Council sessions, India called on Sri Lanka to fully implement the 13th Amendment to the Constitution. Foreign Secretary, retired Admiral Professor Jayanath Kolumbage had told the Hindu newspaper that India cannot abandon Sri Lanka under their neighborhood first policy. The Foreign Secretary had added that President Gotabe Rajapaksa's first letter 
requesting support was to Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi and that his first meeting here was with the Indian High Commissioner. As Sri Lanka is very conscious of South Asian solidarity. Manav Himikam Komasaris to me, eh? Aperata Sambandin Idripat Kerono Varta. Since the beginning, we cited the report that was presented on Sri Lanka by the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights was a biased one. Now the office of the UNHRC has accepted our claim and they have stated that certain amendments have to be done to the report. But that report does not mention anything regarding the incidents that happened during the war. The report has been compiled based on internal matters of Sri Lanka. The report includes the decisions that were taken and the appointments that were made by the government after coming into power in November 2019. These are matters that are entirely out of the subject purview of the UNHRC. This endeavour is being carried out by using Sri Lanka as a football to pass us around. The crossing over for a short commercial break. Stay tuned to News First. Struggling to find reliable plumbers, electricians, gardeners and other service providers? Bellboys got you covered. Yesterday, News First aired remarks made in Jaffna by State Minister Ajit Nivad Khabral stating that Sri Lanka's reserves have declined due to the conduct of the previous government. Cabral made these remarks while claiming that the Sirasa Media Network does not air such statements. This statement, made before the public, is of a serious nature. During yesterday's news broadcast, not only did we air the comments made by the State Minister, we also reminded of the allegations involving Ajit Nivad Cabral during his previous stints in office. This includes investments in the sovereign bonds in Greece, irregularities at the Colombo Stock Exchange, the hedging deal and the Treasury bonds as well. Accordingly, we wish to challenge State Minister Cabral to withdraw the statements that he expressed before the people in Jaffna. In the event of failing to do so, we would be left with no alternative but to remind the people of several other allegations surrounding him. State Minister Ajit Nivad Khabral, you are in Parliament by appointment. If you wish to see for yourself the opinion held by the public regarding you, we challenge you to get yourself elected at least during a Pradeshya Sabha election. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi today received the Covaxin coronavirus vaccine manufactured in India. This was in launching the second phase of the COVID-19 vaccination drive in the country. The Covaxin COVID-19 vaccine was developed jointly by Bharat Biotech India and the Indian Medical Research Institute. The Indian Prime Minister was inoculated with the vaccine against the backdrop where there is controversy over the Covaxin vaccine manufactured in India. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine currently used in Sri Lanka is manufactured by the Serum Institute in India. The Medicines Regulatory Authority of Sri Lanka and the Russian manufacturer have held online discussions regarding the Sputnik V vaccine. The NMRA added the response has been positive. The National Drug Regulatory Authority said it has requested in writing the facts presented by them. Meanwhile, the State Pharmaceutical Corporation has requested the approval of the Medicines Regulatory Authority for the use of Sinopharm, a Chinese vaccine. This is in addition to the Russian vaccine and the Covaxin vaccine. The State Pharmaceutical Corporation said it was in talks with the relevant parent company to obtain the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine. Meanwhile, the Epidemiology Unit of the Ministry of Health states that there is no link between the decrease in reported cases of COVID infections and increasing vaccinations over the past few days. Its chief epidemiologist, specialist Dr. Sudat Samaravira said that the decline in the number of patients was previously projected. Specialist Dr. Sudha Samaravira added that the increase in the number of people travelling during the holiday season in late December had contributed to the increase in infections and added the situation had been brought under control since then. The chief epidemiologist also said the vaccine had not yet been released widely and so it did not have an effect on the spread of the disease. Save, 
Rambakan Noya. Residents of Galbalaya near the Rambakan Noya Forest Reserve have complained of several issues that have arisen as a result of releasing lands for private investors. One such grievance surrounds the acquisition of farmlands that have now been given away to these businesses. The Rambakan Noya Forest Reserve is located in close proximity to Hambehela, Kabragala, Nilgalamani Kavela and the Mulgahausa Reserves. The area is rich in biodiversity and historical value and is believed to be the location of King Buddha Dasa's herbal garden which is famous for its indigenous medicine. Attempts to give away lands embedded in this ecosystem dates back to the 1990s. Between 1990 and 1993, attempts had been undertaken to clear land in Nilgala, believed to be the site of the herbal garden, to pave way for pineapple cultivation. But such efforts had been called off amidst stiff objection from the public. A proposal had been tabled before the cabinet on the 12th of December 2006 to give away 65,000 acres of land from the Rambakan Oya to Nilgala, covering 11 divisional secretariats to commence sugar cultivation. 300 acres alone had been sought from Nilgala for the construction of a sugar factory. But that project too was defeated by the people. In August last year, the executive board of the Sri Lanka Mahaveli Authority had approved a proposal to give away lands from the Rambakan Noya Forest Reserve to a private company. However, this was to be carried out under the condition that it does not damage the forest cover of the area. Cabinet approval had also been granted under several guidelines of the Central Environmental Authority to release 2,750 acres of land for a private investor to commence maize cultivation. This was done under the condition that water bodies and waterways in the forest reserve must remain untouched and that the existing forest cover must be preserved and improved. However, a large area in the forest reserve has been cleared recently, flouting these guidelines. Farmers point out that forest lands and farmlands have also come under the threat of being grazed by large-scale businessmen. We are engaged in cultivation at the Galvalayaya Reserve. The Mahaveli Authority had forcefully destroyed our rubber and cashew cultivations that we have been carrying out for several years. They have sold off these lands to businessmen in Colombo. It is only the mountain ranges that have been left unsold. The Mahaveli Authority is selling these lands to large-scale businessmen and leaving the farmers helpless while strengthening these investors. I only have a plot of land in which I can reap a paddy harvest of 30 kilos, but I have received title deed for one and a half acres of land. Elephant fences have been erected through the center of the village. Elephants encroach into the village when they lose their habitats. Large-scale businesses with ties to powerful political figures are grabbing all these lands. They do not care about the difficulties faced by farmers. News First was able to identify many of the problems faced by the people in these villages in our few days here. To find solutions to these problems, News First will be hosting another phase of the gum at the Pradeshya Mandapya at the bunt of the Rambakanoya. Officials from the Wildlife Conservation Department, Mahavali Development Authority, Central Environment Authority, the GA's office and even those from the local political setup will be there to provide solutions to the issues faced by the people. The Hambantota District Coordinating Committee meeting was held today. Discussions were held regarding the environmental destruction caused by archaeological excavations in various areas of the country. I don't know. It was stopped last time. However, there was an incident near Marmadala, and then it was said that sand should not be removed from coconut and paddy lands. We have informed them. We may cause a massive disaster in this district. <laughs>
My idea was to place a ban on everything. If there is a proposal here, I will ban it. There is a problem. After the ban, the price of a cube of sand will increase by about 5,000 rupees. We have to face that too. I saw how officials presented facts to Minister Chamal Rajapaksa and Mahinda Maravira about stopping this permit system. There they say to stop the sand mining and washing. Then MP Upul Galapate and a politician nearby asked that it not be stopped. He directly implies that he should not come to a point where they turn down this proposal. Then it is clear that the first line is in the legal level. The second lot are part of the scam and the third tier are making money off of it. These three groups are coming together to destroy this environment and biodiversity. The best example for this is the Hambantota DCC that took place today. MBR Pushpakumara was appointed as the secretary to the Ministry of Agriculture earlier today. Pushpakumara, a senior administrative officer, served as the district secretary for Nuarelia and was also a commissioner general of prisons. Retired Major General Sumedha Pereira was the secretary to the Ministry of Agriculture before Pushpakumara's appointment. In addition, BLAJ Dharmakirti was appointed as the secretary to the State Ministry of Batik, Handloom and Local Apparel Products. The National Agrarian Movement, which is affiliated to the National Freedom Front, issued a warning over paddy farming in the country. The National Freedom Front is a party associated with the government. The cost to produce one kilogram of paddy is 70 rupees or 80 rupees. In order to produce one kilogram of rice, you need one and a half kilograms of paddy. However, the farmer engaged in this process eventually falls into debt. Paddy farming is facing serious issues in the country. We have reached a point where farmers might even let go of farming completely. The youth will not come forward to take up farming. They are leaving this trade. In the future, we will face an issue where we will not be able to provide rice to the population. A crossing over for a short commercial break. Stay tuned to News First. Struggling to find reliable plumbers, electricians, gardeners and other service providers? Bellboys got you covered. The Samagi Thaurunabalavege made a complaint to the Central Bank of Sri Lanka today. A group including parliamentarian Mayanta Disanayaka met with the governor of the Central Bank and made the complaint against a senior official at a state-owned bank. We came here to request for an investigation into the corrupt activities and the discrepancies committed by the Chairman of People's Bank. A complaint regarding that was filed today. The Chairman of People's Bank has defrauded money to the tune of 23 million rupees without consulting higher officials in the banking sector. Therefore, through this complaint, we expect the necessary measures will be taken in this regard. We would like to especially remind the People's Bank is under the purview of the Finance Minister Mahinda Rajapaksa. These officials are tarnishing the reputation of the government as well as the Prime Minister. A decapitated body of a woman was discovered inside a large travelling bag left unattended at Gasworks Junction in Dam Street, Colombo, today. Sri Lanka police said the body is of a 20-year-old woman and was discovered stuffed inside a large travelling bag left unattended for a long time at Gas Works Junction. CCTV footage in the area recorded a man pulling the large bag with him along the dam street and then leaving it. 
A fuel tanker caught fire and was destroyed at a filling station in Mamunua, Wariapula today. According to our correspondent, the fire erupted while the tanker was pumping fuel at the filling station. The tanker had been completely destroyed due to the fire and the roof of the filling station and a fueling pump has also been damaged. Due to the fire, transportation along the Kurunagalapadini road was hampered. The fire was doused with the involvement of the fire brigade of the Kurunagal Municipal Council within 30 minutes. The loss incurred to the filling station from the fire has not been estimated yet and the Wairipula police has launched an investigation to ascertain the cause of the fire. News from overseas, former French President Nicolas Sarkozy has been sentenced to three years in jail, two of them suspended for corruption. The 66-year-old Sarkozy was found guilty of trying to bribe a magistrate by offering a prestigious job in Monaco in return for information about a criminal inquiry into his political party. The magistrate, Gilbert Azibé, and Sarkozy's former lawyer, Thierry Ezo, got the same sentence. Sarkozy can serve the term at home. In the ruling, the judge in Paris said Sarkozy could serve a year at home with an electronic tag rather than go to prison. The former president is expected to appeal. The judge said Sarkozy, quote, knew what he was doing was wrong, unquote, adding that his actions and those of Erzo had given the public, quote, a very bad image of justice, unquote. The crimes were specified as influence peddling and violation of professional secrecy. The fiancé of slain South journalist Jamal Khashoggi is calling for Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman to be punished after a U.S. intelligence report found that the kingdom's ruler played a role in the murder of the journalist in 2018. And that's a wrap of Primetime News for today. Don't forget to log on to our award-winning website, www.newsfirst.ok, for more of the latest updates. Thank you very much for watching News First. Good night and take care.